Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Shirley Hoekstra. There are thousands of children in Uganda who can't go to school because their parents can't even afford a pencil. Now what if you're an orphan? For those hundreds of thousands of children, the prospects for getting an education and achieving a brighter future are beyond hope. But when our guest today was confronted with this picture, he and his wife decided to use their savings to establish a free school for orphans. Find out how his dream came true today on Inner Compass. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. My guest today is Twasi J. Jackson Koguri, founder of two free primary schools for children orphaned by AIDS in and near his home village in Uganda. The story of his adventures in starting up the first school is recorded in his book, The Price of Stones, Building a School for My Village. Welcome to a CJ. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. In 1986, your sister said to you, are you interested in girls? And you said, no, I have no time for that. <laughs> do you remember that? Yes, I do. And she was, she was um, not as aware that, as you were that education was your uh, desire and ticket into your future. Yes, for me, right from the beginning, as a young boy, I knew and I set my mind to getting an education, but there was also a little bit, a little pressure from my parents, knowing where the money to pay for our education was coming from. I was set just on one thing, just as other boys would say, don't run after girls, run after education, and after education is run, girls will run after you. Oh. <laughs> and then you did meet a wonderful woman uh, as part of your coming here to America and studying at Columbia. Mm -hmm. What was it like coming to America that first time? Frightening. How so? Frightening because uh, here I was born in a tiny village in Uganda. Tiny village, no running water, no electricity, no access to the outside world. And go through school, I knew I was going to get my degree at Makere University in Uganda and have a job in Uganda and settle in Uganda. Right. So getting this scholarship to come to America, now you are thinking of a strange country, strange people, strange weather. And here I am coming to New York on a January morning after it had snowed, there was a snowstorm, and I didn't even have a coat. So I January in New York City with no coat? No coat, short-sleeved shirt. And so um, did someone uh, aid, give you any aid? Did you have someone meeting you? Uh, the taxi cab that was driving me to Columbia University took me to Harlem and bought me a coat. That's an amazing extension of the hospitality that you had. He was an immigrant from Senegal, so and I'm sure he knew what he was doing. You have a close family back in Uganda. Yes, I do. And uh, one of your brothers, Frank, was a real role model for you in terms of education and helping his village. What did you observe when he would go back? Tell us about that. He would go back to your village and people would line up and be waiting for him. Yes, in a village where I was born and raised, it's called Nyaka. Nyaka is the short name for Nyakajezi, and Nyakajezi means land of hills. Oh. So anywhere you go, you're going to climb a hill. That's where we were born and raised. Five children to peasant family where mom and dad really never had a job. Up to date, they have never had a job. They have never had earned any money. But, but they use uh, agriculture, they, they were working on their land or had animals to care for? Exactly. We had goats and chicken and cows, and that's what they sold for us to get an education. But in a, an environment like that also, uncles and aunts and other people in the village really are caretakers of children. If you are walking around and you are hungry all of a sudden, you don't have to wait until you get home. You can go to the next home and tell whoever is there, Mom, I would like to drink something. And they would take you in the house and feed you and send you home. The same with when you are in trouble. Ah. They will grab you and 
give you a spanking and send you home and you better not tell dad because you get another one for being uh, a shameful part of the family. But my brother watched this growing up. He watched hospitality in my mom's house and my dad's house. Our grandfather had been this wonderful model who housed everyone who was sick because he lived near the hospital. He fed everybody who came to church on Saturday. We were raised Seventh-day Adventists. He gave land to build a church. So we were raised around philanthropy. He was a village leader. Exactly. He was a village leader, church leader, founder of the church. This faith and extending love beyond yourself was instilled in us as children. So my brother was doing an extension of what is expected of you as a human being, selfless giving. And so whenever he went back in the village, because people in the village knew that my brother had gotten education and so knows the value of education, he was the man they would go to to ask for a pencil, a pen, or even a paper so their kids can stay in school. And I would help out handing these pencils, and I admired that about him. When you talk about extending this love beyond himself, it was as important as a pencil, because if you didn't have a pencil or paper or a uniform, you weren't able to go to school. That's right. In Uganda at that time, education was paid for. Even today, education is paid for. And if you don't have a pencil and come to a class, a teacher will say, Jackson, where's your pencil? And I don't have a pencil. Go back home and get a pencil. You go back home and tell your mommy in these circumstances, often we take care of, tell their grandma, grandma, you want a pencil, and grandma has no pencil. Right. And education for a child ends right there because they don't have a pencil. And a pencil in Uganda will cost you two cents. And what your father did was he took a pencil and you had five uh, children in your family? Yes. And tell us what he did. My father, knowing that, he would buy one number one, number two pencil. You call them number two. Right. That yellow pencil with eraser. Yes. He would buy that one pencil and cut it five times. Five times. And if, you I would probably cherish that small piece of pencil. As long as you had that little pencil in your hand, a teacher will never send you home. Wow. But if you lost it, then dad will pull out another one and cut you a small piece. Rather than lose the whole one, he would rather send you with a small one. Right. But the funny thing about the pencil story, my sisters would never let me have one with a razor. Oh, they always took the side with the eraser and <laughs> yes. you always got something else. I was else. the youngest. <laughs> so you got the So the side. oldest would get a razor and I never got it because I was the last one. Now you came back from the United States and you went to your village mm -hmm. and they lined up for you too, but you saw, you saw something different. The lines and the children you noticed were qualitatively different. What did you see? At the time when kids were right lining up with my brother and passing these pencils, he was passing them to children who had parents. These kids would go back home, they would come with a brother or an uncle or a mother or a father. By the time I went back to this village, after my brother now is dead, my sister is dead of HIV AIDS, now the children who are coming were either coming alone or coming with their elder grandmothers. And growing up in an environment I grew up in, you know everybody. So you would see this grandmother who in 1977 carried me on their back take me to the hospital as I fell out of a tree and injured myself so bad. And all you could see is this grandmother now, 85 year old with a seven year old child, hand in hand, pleading her case. I can't send him anymore. I don't have uniform. Uniform is $5. Right. I don't have a book, three bucks for books for a whole year for a child. Here is a grandmother who can't do it. And so I passed these pencils, these pens, over and over and over until a time came when he said, you know what? You can pass the pencils, you can give these lines, we never cease, let's build a school and help more children rather than pass individual pencils. The value of education uh, uh, in, in, in this setting also goes back to that good life 
a child looks forward to getting an education so one time they can have this good life and escape, break the cycle of poverty, poverty and deprivation. That's on the child's side. On the parent's side and grandmother's side, it has something to do with an insurance. You are their investment. You are their working capital. And so when they educate a child and the child graduates, that's the first time they are going to get a spoon, a fork in their house. That's the first time they are going to sleep in bed sheets. They educate you so you can come back and take care of them. In Uganda, there are no retirement homes. Your, child, your parents get older, they will come and live with you. And now I was dealing with grandparents whose children had already passed away, whose investment and Wall Street had already crashed, whose health care and social security is not there anymore. All they are looking at is our grandchildren are also going to die. What can we do? How did you live with the fact that you lived in America and that um, you had left that and had uh, some substantial comfort, um, and yet you had your parents, your family. Did they want to immigrate too? Did they, did they want you to take them with them or, or not? And my family has never wanted to move to America. Actually, one time I asked them, should we move you from the village to the city where you have electricity and, and more comfort? And they said, no, this is who we are. This is how we raised you. We want to stay with our friends and our community. Yeah. But being here in the United States and looking at the value of a dollar and how when you change it, how much money you get in Uganda, the two cents example I just gave you, and then you think of that one back in your pocket or in your car that you drop there, change, 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 and you have like three dollars, and you think how many pencils that change would buy and how many children's lives to break the cycle of poverty would happen as a result of that change, you become a philanthropist. You become a philanthropist, you become an economic engine for your village. Exactly. How did you even believe that you, as one individual, could start a school, build a school, school rooms, supply the teachers, supply all the paper, the pencils? How did you believe you could do it? Part was faith, faith in, in what I knew, and uh, faith in what we are raised to believe, but there was also some stubbornness. Oh, and is there anyone else stubborn <laughs> as in your family? We know about this. <laughs> My dad is. Yes. Yes. What was the biggest obstacle in getting started? Lots of obstacles. <laughs> the biggest was my father. The biggest was your father? Yes. My father looked at me when I told him we are going to build a school for the village, and he went back to what I explained to you how a child is an investment for his, par for his parents. He looks at me and says, I educated you to finish and come take care of me. I've already lost one son. Right. I've almost already lost your sister. Now I'm going to lose you to a community too. Right. Instead of taking care of me and your mom, now you want to take care of the whole village. He didn't think there would be enough. No. Yeah, he didn't have the concept of how it was going to work. But you did. I did. And your mother, did she believe in you? My mother always believed in me. Right. So what was the first seed money for your school? It was $5,000, and my wife and I had spared to buy a house in Bloomington, Indiana. So it was your down payment for a house? Yes. And your wife is really, in many ways, the co-founder of this school. It's definitely, she is. You have down payment, you're ready to buy a house, it's enough, you have a car, one car, and now your husband is saying, oops, maybe we invest in children in Uganda. Right. And yeah. the need was overwhelming, so mm -hmm. she knew that it wasn't going to be just that. Uh, in the beginning, talking about it, she had not seen it really discussing it, but as soon as we got there and she saw the faces of children we are talking about, now the tables changed. She was the one saying, let's do it oh. right now. And I'm like, are you sure? Yes. Then I go, wow. This is a partnership, isn't it? It is. Between you and your it's wife. It's been uh, a mission of life. We still do it wonderfully together. You were also able to get some grants and then some churches started to also be part of this vision. Um, how did you know that you could be a fundraiser? Right from uh, 
My background right at university, I started a human rights organization in Uganda. And what we would do as human rights advocates at the time is really to write grants uh, from USID, from Canadian Development uh, International, Dan the Danish International Agency. So we, I knew a little bit on how to write a grant, make your case, make a justification, put a budget there. I didn't know how to ask individuals money. But when you are raised in a church, you also know you can stand in front of people and talk. And so what I told myself there was, this is not about you, Jackson. This is about someone else. You either say something and people will help, or you keep quiet and children not go to school. Right. People will ask, how much does it take to do this? And I would tell them how much it is. And eventually I learned and did research and did, took fundraising classes at Indiana University. So you got prepared and then you worked your heart out. Exactly. It. Just like Moses in the Bible, when you are called, you want to kick and, and give excuses. Lord, I can't speak right. Lord, why, why me? Why not somebody else who speaks good? But uh, when it is your calling, yes, you have to say, Lord, here I am, send me. You started the first day of school uh, with a birthday cake. And tell us how you changed the self-image of these children. So you are now in a village where you have more than 5,000 children who are orphaned as a result of HIV and AIDS. We didn't know this. 5,000 people in your own little village? In uh, what you would call a county. Okay. Here. In Uganda, you call them districts. 5,000. And here we were uh, with the two-loomed bare bricks, stone by stone, two buildings, dust in, in, in and uh, shutters wooden shutters, and you are telling these 5,000 people that you're going to select 56 oh, students. 56 only. Those are the students that started at Nyaka, 56 students. So number one, it was so hard to select those 56, and what we did was tell the management committee, people on the ground who know each other, who know who is related to who, to help us with that. And here we are selecting 56 students and once the 56 students were there and they, had, they have their uniform, they chose their own colors, purple and white, for happiness. And the significance of a cake was now, from now onwards, your life takes on a different journey. We declared the cycle of poverty and privation ends right there. It was their first birthday. You are in an environment where kids never celebrate any birthdays. They are birthdays when they begin at our school. And so they were now students, no longer orphans. That's right. Tell us about Bruno, who is a student and an orphan. Students and children of God. Yes. And when we speak to, to, to an, an audience anywhere, then these students become yours. They become the producer's students. They are all yours now. Each time I go anywhere, I give some to people. Bruno is the one everyone wants to take because we highlight his, his story in the book and also in many of our publications. So Bruno is orphaned. His dad used to be a businessman, lived in the area, built a good big compound. Big compound in this sense is a house with three rooms, uh, iron sheet room, and it is on top of a hill seven miles away from Nyaka school. Seven miles? Seven miles. Bruno started in Nyaka, and he never told anybody about his living environment. And so this one day I'm in Uganda, and we play soccer, and after soccer it starts raining, and I put kids in a land cruiser and drive them the closest to their homes. The last kid was Bruno, and I said, Bruno, I walk you home. First he was hesitant and didn't like it, but I walked him home and we get to this house and Bruno lives in the house by himself. And he's 13 and he's all by himself in the daytime getting breakfast, if he has food for breakfast, at nighttime after school doing his chores, 
and his studies all by himself. Exactly. He doesn't actually even study because they come to school at 8 and they leave school at 5.30. He comes in the dark, goes back in the dark. What really frightened me getting to his house, there was no even a lantern. They use lanterns just like this cup with mm -hmm. something sticking out, you light fire on top. He didn't even have money to buy paraffin for his lantern. So as soon as you get home, you close the shutters and go to bed in the dark and sleep. So I asked him a question. I said, Bruno, it gets so dark here. You are by yourself. Other kids will talk to each other at night. What do you do? And he said, I close my eyes and I do my homework in my head. This is how he knew to cope. You found out, didn't you, that it wasn't just the education piece, but it was these kinds of things that Bruno was facing. Exactly. You look at Bruno, you look at an other girls who, who are coming to school and have to wake up in the morning and live with grandma and grandma can't fetch water and they have to go fetch water two miles away, bring water home and then walk seven miles to school. So what we did is look at this holistic approach as soon as, as as they started, the first week, we realized there's something wrong here. You can't educate minds if they are not fed. Right. So we started a feeding program by starting a gardening program at school. So they grow their own food in the garden, they harvest food and eat it at school. So that was quick, fix, do it. Everyone participates, they learn agriculture, they have food. Now hire somebody to cook it. Then we realize these kids are coming to school stunted. They've never had good nutrition and balanced diet. They have kwashako, they have fungus in their head, they have worms, they've never been vaccinated. So we hired a school nurse, which is a revolutionary idea in Uganda. School nurse, nurses are in hospitals, not at schools. But the school nurse also solved another issue that affects education in Uganda because when a parent or a grandmother is sick, usually a girl child will, kept, will be kept home to take care of the sick person. And now with the school nurse at our school, we told our guardians, send a child to school and the nurse will come home and bring you medication. So you gave a substitute person exactly. for the student. Then we constructed a water project. Instead of waking up and walk 20 mile, t two miles to go fetch water and then walk seven to school, seven back, that's 14. The two to the where and back, that is four, that is 20 miles in a day. Now we cut it to 14. Those extra miles that she would have walked, now she's in the classroom concentrating. Then we started a reading program. Then we started an anti-AIDS program. These kids' parents have died of HIV AIDS. Now they are advocating against HIV AIDS. So bringing all this together, health, food, water, reading, then going to grandmother's programs and help grandmothers also at home. This holistic approach has worked. When our children sat for the exams in a tiny village, eight hours away from Kampara, they all have passed the exams three years in a row. This is a moment of satisfaction for you to see oh, yeah. that this plan has produced good students and you actually promise the students that if they do well in their exams they get a secondary education paid for as well. Yes we did. When you bath your own child you don't tell them oh I will take care of you for three years then we will see what happens after that. Right. You, we look our children in the eyes every day. Dad will be there for you no matter what. If, whether it is when you are in college, whether you, you graduate and, and these young men move on and go to college, they know they can always come back home. Their mom will make them the best meal. They'll get a hug and they can sit and watch their best show with mom. And remember, these children came in and really took a leap of faith and told these children, we will be there for you no matter what. So you have hundreds of children, don't you, Jackson? 500. 500 children <laughs> under your care and your wife's care in some way. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. And really, they become all our children. When you see and meet and read about these children, they are just born in a different circumstance. They love the same things your children would love, your grandchildren would love. They are completely loving children and take so little 
to change their lives. And that's what Nyaka does, to be there for them no matter what. And the ones who have graduated now, three classes are all in secondary school. And one who didn't pass their national exams took a driver's test and went in a mechanic school. And this December, when I was in Uganda, he had his certificate. He comes running, director, director, I know how to drive. I gave him keys, and he drove me through the village, oh, smiling hard. That was a proud day. First employee of our organization uh, who is a product of our organization. When you go back and see your school three times a year, you get re-energized, don't you? Yes, I do. And when we hear about your stories, people see that one man has made a huge difference. Maybe I could make a difference. What would you suggest to those people? There's so much we can give. People think of Bill Gates, they think of Oprah Winfrey, they think of billionaires and millionaires. But we tend to forget that we can also give time. Time, the kids, the, the, the young students who sit there and pray on Facebook every day, if they sent a page of our students to all their friends, and their friends sent it to somebody else, and somebody says, oh, I looked on the website, and really I could improve this website by giving an hour a day. Oh, I can help this PowerPoint and send it to another classroom and use it in their classroom. Everyone can make a difference. If a kid from a village like mine, who never touched a computer until I was 26, who never drove a car until I was 26, who never had a shoe until I was 17, can come in with that a fifth of a pencil and get into Columbia University, anyone can do it. My guest today, has been Twaysa J. Jackson Kogori, founder of Free Primary Schools for Children Orphaned by AIDS in Uganda. He is author of the book, Price of Stones, Building a School for My Village. I'm Shirley Hoekstra, and thank you for watching Inner Compass. Yeah.